Okay, guys, we are going to pick up where we left off the other day. Um, I'm going to kind of stay back here because I don't have my headphones. Uh, so I got to be close to my, my laptop um, for us to, the audio to pick up. The, the main thing we talked about on Friday was just the kind of the general behavior of any exponential, okay, and we we wrote it as y equals k times a to the x. I want you to know that that k and that a are interchangeable with any other variable you want, okay. Um, you'll see a lot of times like y equals a times b to the x, or you might even see them flip those work b times a to the x, okay. Uh, but that first variable, that first variable up front is your scalar multiplier. It's your vertical stretch, okay? Um, if it's a one, a lot of times it's not written. It's just an understood one. <laughs> and all you see is your base, A or B or whatever we're calling it. Um, remember that on Friday? We're good with that? Okay. Now, we talked about kind of working through the, the overall graph of these things. Uh, if I go uh, just right now a to the x, okay, because my, my value out front, my k, isn't going to really change anything. Uh, if I take x and allow it to increase, okay, can I take any a, let's just say a is 2, so i got 2 to the x. Can I take 2 and raise it to any number and get something back? Yeah. Any positive number over here, raise 2 to that, you're going to get something back, okay? Can I raise 2 to the 0 and get something back? Yep. Okay. Can I take 2 and raise it to any negative number and get something back? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's no domain issues here. The one thing I want us to understand, though, is if I go 2 to the negative 1, that becomes 1 half, right? 2 to the negative 2 becomes 1 fourth. 2 to the negative 3 becomes 1 eighth. Okay. So... My numerator, when I go a negative number, okay, and it doesn't have to be an integer, it can be negative 3.5, whatever, okay, my numerator is going to be 1, isn't it? Is there any way that it's going to become 0? No, okay, there's no way that I can make my numerator become 0, so there's no way that I can make my quotient become 0. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so my quotient can never be 0, but think about this, that numerator I'm sorry, the numerator is 1, always going to be 1. The denominator is growing exponentially. 2 becomes 4. 4 now doubles become 8. 8 will double become 16, right? Okay. Um, that thing's going to get very, very large. A 1 divided by a very, 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 very large number is close to what? 0. Is it 0? No, but it gets close to it. Okay. And that's why we said that our x axis there becomes a horizontal asymptote for us with these exponential functions. Now, if, the, if those pieces of information are all understood, we should be able to identify the domain range for our exponential function to come across. The domain, because there's no division by zero, because there's no even roots, the domain is all real numbers. Okay, that was the idea of us saying, do I get something back from these certain values of x? And we do, okay? Um, the range, because of that asymptote, and the fact that we will not cross that asymptote with an exponential, my range is 0 to infinity. Okay? But I do not include 0. Is that all right? So I cannot make that 1 divided by whatever into 0. So those are some key ideas or key components to um, exponential functions. The next thing we're going to do is they're going to give us a graph and then ask you, can you create the equation? of that graph. The first thing we have to recognize is that it's growing exponentially, okay? So it's not anything that we've seen before. Obviously, hopefully you would, you would make the argument that if you saw something like this, then you're going to say, well, that graph is probably a rational function, right? Or if you saw something like this, you say, well, that graph is polynomial, right? Okay? So right now we look at this and say, Exponential. Okay, it's growing. 
When we do this, they're going to have to give you two points. Okay? This one's kind of easy, but they're not giving you that point real well. That point is 0, 1. They need to give me two points because in our basic formula, okay, we have multiple variables that we need to find. Okay, uh, We need to find K and we need to find A. So they need to give me two points to be able to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, if, if I look at this, okay, is this an X value and is that a Y value? Yeah. Okay. And you're going to want to use that one first. You're always going to go to the Y intercept and use that one first. And this is the reason why. If I, if I don't do that first, I'm not going to be able to uh, kind of evaluate. And I'll give you an example of that here in a minute. If I go, Y is 1, K, A, X is 0, right? This is the reason I want to try that Y intercept first is because it, if there's three variables, or sorry, four variables up here, right? This allows me, using this one, allows me to fill in three of those. Ultimately, filling in two of them, but what's that going to become? One, right? So it kind of dissolves three of the variables, leaving me then one is equal to K. Does that make sense? Okay. Once I've got that, then I'm going to go back and say, okay, well, now Y is equal to one times A to the X. Now, now how do I find A? I'm going to use this second ordered pair. It's another x and y, right? So you get 25. K was 1. A, I don't know. But x is 2. So I give me a squared equals 25. So what's a going to be? A is 5. You now know x or k, and you know a. And those are the only two things that you need to come up with an equation that is exponential 1 times 5 to the x. Now, a lot of times because that is a 1, we won't write it as 1. We'll just write 5 to the x. Is that something we can do? Okay. Now, the reason I have to do it that way is because I have to start with that um, 0, 1 ordered pair. If I didn't start with that, If I did not start with that, what I'd be starting with is obviously the 225. So I'd have y equals k times a to the x. y is 25. k I don't know. a I don't know. x is 2. Do you see how you'd still be left with two variables here, a and k, where previously when I let a to the 0, that a to the 0 dissolves that a variable. Not able to solve for k. Okay, so you have to start with the uh, the y-intercept. Okay, so I got a couple more here that I want to work on with you. A little bit more interesting because of how that um, k value shows up here. We go y equals k times a dx. Okay, what's my what's the y value you're going to start with here? Three. Okay, you don't know. And A you don't know, but what's X? Zero. What's A to the zero? One. So you got three is equal to K times one. Let's make sure it's still recording. All right. Um, we're then going to come over and do this again. We're going to go Y equals k, but k is now 3 times a to the x. But y then is, in this case, we're going to use that second ordered pair. So y is 48. You got 3, a, x would be 2. So now, if I want to solve for a, what do I have to do first? Divide by 3. 
So now what's A going to be? Four. Okay. So we're going to write Y equals K times AX, which ends up being three times four to the X. Now I'm going to ask you this question. Is that equivalent to 12 to the X? It is not. Okay. And understand why. If X, say, was, um, you know, here, let's do it this way. If X is 1, I have 3 times 4 to the 1, right? Well, that gives me 12, right? Go over here. X is 1. That gives me 12. They were equal, correct? If I tried 0, the 0 right there give me, what is it, 3 times 1, right? Try here. 12 times 0 give me 1, right? Does 3 equal 1? No. Try another one. Try to, it, It's a little bit more obvious, I think, if you try 2. Try 2, okay? This is going to give me 3 times 4 squared, and it's going to be 12 squared, right? So order of operations tells me to do what here first? You square first. So that's going to give me 16 times 3, which would be 48. What's this going to give me? 144, okay? That is the reason why 3 times 40x is not the same thing as 12x, or 12 to the x, okay? Um, you have to understand that 4 is getting squared, cubed, raised to 4th, 5th power, whatever, before we're multiplying by 3, okay? Is that all right? All right, I want to do this one. Mainly because now this one here is doing a different behavior, right? Okay. This here, and you're, we're going to talk about these types of things, but that obviously we call that exponential growth. Okay. And there's a lot of areas of science and finance that we're interested in growth. Okay. Um, if you guys think about um, in the last the example I gave in the last class was. I don't know how many years ago it was. It was probably, it was probably over five years ago. There was a, uh, and it's still an outbreak, but uh, you don't hear about it as much anymore. But in Africa, there's an Ebola outbreak. Okay, uh, Ebola, very, very dangerous, deadly, uh, very contagious disease. Right? Okay, it's a virus. Um, so there were there were a couple um, American doctors and nurses over there trying to treat Ebola, trying to uh, minimize its effects in, in Africa and its spread. Um, and they're obviously, Africa being, you know, most countries there being third world countries, don't have the infrastructure, the, the medical infrastructure that we have, right? Okay. So somebody here gets Ebola, they get quarantined, whatever. Uh, no human contact. And if they do, people are in like hazmat suits dealing with them, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Over there, you're not. Okay. Uh, I mean, you're just open to it. You're, you're very, very susceptible uh, to contracting the disease, okay? So what happened is a doctor over there, uh, and it happens several times, but a doctor or a nurse gets on, gets infected. They don't know it right away because it's a couple, I think it's a couple days or a couple weeks before you start to see symptoms. They contract the disease. They get on a 747 and they come back to America. When they get on that 747, I told you it's a highly contagious disease, right? They get on 747, 200 other people on it, okay? It's highly likely that those 200 other people, a good majority of them, not all of them, because you might, you might not come in contact with all of them, okay? But I believe Ebola is spread through the respiratory system. So breathing, right? Um, the other people start contracting this virus, okay? So let's say half of these 200 people get this um, spread to them. They then go other places, right? They leave the plane. So this one person infects 100 people, okay? Those 100 people get off the plane. Some of them go home. Maybe they, they meet a taxi driver. Maybe their family. Maybe they spread the disease that way. But a lot of those other people, maybe you're on a connecting flight. So they get on another flight, right? And now one more person, that's one person now infecting another maybe 100 people. Does that make sense? Okay? So one person infects 100 but then that, in turn, maybe infects 1,000. And that, in turn, maybe infects 100,000. Does that make sense? And that spreads very, very, very rapidly. Okay? 
Um, when we talk about the spread of bacteria, the spread of viruses, the spread of diseases uh, that are communicable like that, uh, we talk about how they grow exponentially. Okay, you talk about cell division. Cell division divides and increases exponentially, right? Okay. Um, so if you're a person that's interested in the medical field, this thing, this stuff is very useful, very important. Okay. Cancer research is going to be dealing with exponentials a lot. Okay. Because of how, you know, your bad cells kind of multiply and create tumors like that, right? And, and what our goal is to see if we can kind of reduce that exponential growth. Um, you guys have talked about half-life in uh, science class, right? Radioactive decay. Okay. Half-life meaning that for a duration of time, if I start with 100 grams of some type of radioactive substance that has, let's say, a half-life carbon has like a half-life of like 5,000 years, right? So let's say I start with 100 grams. After 5,000 years, I now have 50, right? Okay, half of what I started with. After 10,000 years, I now have 25 which would be a quarter of what I started with, right? Okay. Uh, and then after the next 5,000 years, I'd have 12.25, right? I'm oh, sorry, 12.5. I'd have half of the 25. And I keep having that every duration, right? Well, that's called exponential decay. And that's kind of what would be represented in this picture here, okay? So you see the growth model, and now you see a decay model. Uh, let's find it's... Um, equation here. Again, go y equals k times a to the x. Which point are we going to use first? Zero, one third. So we got one third is equal to y. K, I don't know. A, I don't know. X is zero, right? So what's k going to be? K is one third. Next step is to take that, do it again. And I get that, right? Now, y is going to be what in this case? The second iteration I have to use the second order pair, right? So y becomes four thirds. Still have one third a to the negative two. I'm going to walk through the complete algebra of this, but hopefully, at some point, and hopefully, we're, most of us are there already. Now, when we multiply both sides by three here. Maybe we can already see what A has to be. Um, but if we get 4 equals A to negative 2, it's going to be the full steps of algebra here would be to take this A to negative 2 and rewrite it as 1 over A squared, right? The next thing would be to multiply both sides by A squared, right? The next thing would be divide both sides by 4. And the next thing would be to square root both sides. Square root of 1 is 1. Square root of 4 is 2. So now I know y equals a, well, sorry, k was 1 third. a now is my 1 half. And I raise it to the x. Okay, when we write our exponential in our base as a fraction, we're always going to want to write that fraction in parentheses like that. Okay. Um, now, I told you on Friday that that could actually, that you could actually come up with something different here. Okay. Remember on Friday we did this. If I go 1 over 2 raised to the x, is that the same thing as 1 over x? Or sorry, 1 to the x divided by 2 to the x. Now, what is 1 to the x always going to be regardless of what x is? It's going to be 1. Is 1 over 2 to the x the same thing as 2 to the negative x? Okay. So we just have shown that 1 half raised to the x is the same thing as 2 to the negative x. So if you prefer or if you would like, you could write this thing this way. Okay. And if we type that in, one third times two to the negative x, you see that that red curve 
is the same as the blue or purple one that it started at. And the, and the, the first one I had was the one third times one half to the x. Is that something we can do? Okay, now I might ask questions down the road. This relationship, is there a difference and that kind of stuff? And my hopes are that you can recognize that algebra uh, to make that argument. Um, all right, so that's good. Those, that's a series of questions that you're going to be asked about in regards to uh, exponentials. The next thing I want to talk about is how we use this. Okay, um, and there's a couple slides here, but let me get rid of this, and we'll we'll just kind of talk about this without going through the PowerPoint. Um, we just mentioned that exponentials are useful in talking about growth, right? Okay. Uh, and, and a lot of times, guys, you're going to talk about um, growth of populations, okay? Whether it's a population of viruses, a population of infected individuals, population of just people in general, okay? Um, might be a population of bacteria, cells, whatever, okay? A population of objects that you guys are going to be very, very interested in at some point in your life, if not already, is population of dollars, okay? Um, every time that you put money into an account, okay, when I get on my Edward Jones account, okay, and it tells me the, the amount that I have saved up for my retirement, that's a population of $1 bills, isn't it? Okay. Or if you want to break it down even further, it's a population of pennies. Okay. That's what a lot of times that we're going to be interested in in regards to um, exponentials. We want to see those things grow exponentially. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I just kind of use the, the rabbit idea. Okay. If I've got two rabbits, soon that's going to turn into a litter of rabbits eventually, right? And now I've got maybe a total of 10 rabbits. Okay. And now you can kind of pair those off. And start to see, okay, now each pair of those rabbits, would be five, uh, are going to have their own limits. Okay, and now maybe I've got, after having a, a small number of two to ten, and now maybe the next uh, kind of cycle, I'll have maybe 50 rabbits. And they grow exponentially, right? Okay, so we have the initial rabbits making more rabbits. And then again, those initial rabbits will eventually make more rabbits again as well, right? They have more, they, they have more breeding cycles than just one in their, their life cycle lifespan right and that's kind of what we want with our money okay we want our initial money to have kind of a breeding cycle that occurs more than once does that make sense okay so here's the idea you guys understand what simple interest is i hope okay um just using some variables here i'm just gonna say that uh, a is the amount in the account uh, after some time period, I'm going to say that P is what we call our principal. Okay, your principal in it's spelled right, it's AL in this case, uh, is the uh, initial amount that you start with. Okay, it's what you put in. Okay, now when I talk about account like this. Uh, you know, maybe it's a savings account, maybe it's a, a money market account, something like that. Now, all those things have different kind of um, ways of being kind of analyzed and used, and the returns are uh, expressed differently and all that kind of stuff. But if we're looking at compound interest uh, or simple interest, P is the amount that you start with. Okay. Um, I'm going to write I. And that's going to be our interest rate. Okay, and our interest rate is always between, it's a percent between zero and 100. Okay. Um, well, I want, I want you guys to understand, and hopefully you do. Let's say I start with um, a principal of $100. And let's say my interest rate is 3%. Which is the same thing as 0 0.03, right? Okay. And let's just say, I don't care what the time period is. Let's just say it's one year. Okay. 
uh, or one one kind of uh, what we call a compound period or a rollover period. Uh, let's say that our if our principal is hundred dollars and my interest rate is three percent, my interest rate is going to provide me more money, right? Okay. I take my one hundred dollars and multiply by point zero three. And that's going to give me $100 plus 3, which is $103, right? Does that make sense? It's kind of like how you guys would do sales tax, correct? Okay. Um, that's simple interest. Now, the idea is if, if we're just solely interested in simple interest, is that when I go through a second time period, my $100 is the only thing that's going to make me money. So every time period, so time period, let's just say, one, two, three, four. Okay. I start with an initial principal of a hundred dollars, but this time period here is going to yield me three bucks. That one's three bucks. That one's three bucks. That one's three bucks. Right. So I made the same amount every single time period. My initial hundred dollars is the only thing that impacts my return. Okay. That stinks. We don't like that. All right. The idea is. In this second time period, I would like to start, instead of with $100, let's roll over the $3 I made, and let's make that my new principal. So here, my new principal is $103. Does that make sense? So now I take that $103, and we'll multiply it by 0 .03 again. Okay? And now it's going to give me, what, 100 or so it's going to give me, uh, $3.09. So now I'm going to have uh, 106.09. It's better than the 106 that I would have had if my $100 was the only thing making me interest, right? Okay. And now the next time, this becomes my new principal. We're interested in a formula that's going to allow us to see, okay, what do I have after 12 years or 12 time periods? I don't want to have to make that list out. Does it make sense? So we come up, we generate a formula here. So, this is the way it's done. If I've got my amount. It is P, my principal, plus what I earn off that principal, right? My, uh, my principal times my interest. That's the $100 plus then that $3, correct? Are we all in agreement that I can rewrite that as P times 1 plus I? Okay, so this is this is my amount after one time period. Okay, or maybe we call it a compound. Okay, because now we call it a compound because next time I'm going to start with this. Does that make sense? So in my second compound, my second time period, my amount is now my new principal is not going to be P. It's going to be what this was. Does that make sense? So now I'm going to start with P1 plus I. And that is now going to be that, or what that was in the first uh, simple interest prop process. But now that is going to make money for me when I multiply it by my interest rate, isn't it? Okay. So this idea here, so this would have been the 100 this would have been the $3, this would have been $103, right? Does that make sense? So now down here, this is $103, and this is going to be the, eventually, what ended up being $3.09. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. I'm going to do a little bit of algebra here. I'm going to leave that first one alone. This back one, I'm going to rewrite this way. All I do is I take that I, because this is all multiplication, right? Okay, use my commutative property and put it with my PI, or my P, so it makes it PI. Okay, does this look like factor by grouping? Because my set of parentheses are the same thing, right? Can I rewrite that then as P plus PI? So these terms out in front times 1 plus i. That makes sense, everybody? 
What can come out of these two? P. So can I rewrite this as P 1 plus I times 1 plus I? What can I rewrite that as? P times 1 plus I squared. Okay. So that's the amount after... Two compounds. All right, let's keep going. I'm going to do a third compound. If I do a third compound, now this is what we're start with, right? So that's now going to be, what, 106.09 cents. I'm going to start with that as my new principle, P, 1 plus I squared, plus then, I want that 106.09 cents to be multiplied by 3% again, right? So we'll take P, 1 plus I squared, times I. Can I do the same algebra? Move the I with my P. Okay. Now, does that look like factor by grouping again? So this can turn into... P plus PI times 1 plus I squared, right? What can come out of the first two terms? P is 1 plus I times 1 plus I squared, which is going to turn into 1 plus I cubed, right? And that's the amount after three time periods, or three compounds. What are you seeing as a pattern here? This was after one year, right, or one compound. This was after two. This was after three. Are they all the same? P plus one plus I raised to then how many times we've compounded? Okay. So what I'm going to write here, I'm going to erase this. Is everybody okay with me erasing this? Let's run out of room. What we have just established there is a pattern, right? Okay, uh, we call this kind of a, a proof or a derivation by um, induction. Induction is seen patterns. So what we see here is that my amount is going to be my original principle times 1 plus I times however many times I compound. So right now it's going to say K is how many times I compound. Okay, and that would be my compound interest formula. Okay, but here's what banks do. You, just financial institutions do is that they say we're not going to just compound this once a year okay we'll do you a favor because because it banks a business right okay and they they have to have marketing tools one of their marketing tools is to say this is how many times we're going to roll over your money because chase might roll it over every day superior might roll it over four times a year it might be more beneficial for you to choose Chase then. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, we'll see some situations where maybe that's what they mark it as, but it's actually better to choose Superior, even though they only roll over four times a year. Okay, depending on what your interest rate is. Um, so here's what happens. We, we want to do this. We want to roll this over several times during a time period. Okay, and I'm going to say a time period is a year. Um, so here's the idea. We let I equal R divided by N. R is your rate. It's your interest rate. Okay, but N is your number of compounds. The idea is within one time period, if I'm going to compound it, let's say, 12 times. So let's say my time period is one year. I'm going to compound it every month, so n is 12. I am not going to earn all 3% every single month. Does that make sense? Okay, because my 3%, my, my interest rate is always pre presented as a yearly or annual interest rate. Okay? <coughs> so in one month or in one compound cycle, I'm only going to earn a 12th of that interest rate. Does that make sense? So that's why we rewrite it I as R over N. That's going to give me that 1 12th on that interest rate. Does that make sense, everybody? The next thing we're going to do is say, okay, well, K 
if you remember when we K was that one, that two, that three, how many times we compounded it, right? Well, if I'm going to compound it monthly, that would now become a 12, right? But if I'm leaving this thing in this account for three years, and I compound it monthly for three years, would that become 36? So what we end up doing is that that K turns into my number of compounds times T, where T is number of years. And it's always presented as years. So if they say you're going to leave this in your account for 36 months, you need to change that to a 3. Okay? Or if you're leaving it in there uh, for 6 months, you need to change T to a 0.5. Okay? So when I start making these substitutions, the amount after time T is equal to my principal. 1 plus I now just became R over N. And K just became N times T. Okay? That is my compound interest formula. You've seen it before. You may, might have used this a little bit in Algebra 2. Uh, I don't know that you were told or explained where it came from. Okay? I think it's important to see where it comes from. It's just P plus PI, right? Okay? Uh, and, and then working through that, see, okay, well, what if I keep rolling that P plus PI over as a new principle? What does that generate? Okay? Uh, and, and then with a little bit of substitution to, uh, to understand that interest rate, we get that formula. Okay? So here's what they ask you to do. You're going to see questions that says, take this thing, and with this particular interest rate and this number of compounds, determine what amount is left in your account after so many years. So I'll give you an example here. All right, so they say a sum of money is invested at an interest rate of 12% per year. Find the amounts of the account after three years. If interest rate is compounded annually, what's annually mean? One time. What's semi-annually mean? Two times. What's quarterly mean? Four. Monthly? Twelve. Daily? What about, uh, you're going to see some others. Weekly? Fifty-two. Bi-weekly? Twenty-six. Okay. Um, is it okay? So those, those are just kind of uh, key phrases that we got to attach numbers to. So now the idea is take A after time T. So in our case, our time T is going to be 3 here in a moment. Uh, says I'm going to take my principal of $1,000, 1 plus my interest rate. Now it's always got to be as a decimal. So 12.12. 12. My end value is my number of compounds, so annually is going to be 1. And then we go 1 times T, which T is going to be 3, right? Now I put some stuff in red there because as they ask me to do annually, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly, and daily, the red things are the only things that change, right? My number of compounds is what's changing. So I'm going to grab... It doesn't matter what calculator you grab, but I think most of us are probably going to probably have the TIE 3 at, at hand, right? Okay, and maybe use Desmos. Desmos is obviously a lot easier uh, to do this. But I'm going to type in 1,000. We're going to go 1 plus. Now, I don't need parentheses here because of order of operations, so I'm just go point um, 1, 2 divided by 1 raised to. Now, I always like to do it this way. Now, 1 times 3 is obviously just going to be 3, right? But because I know I'm going to be asked several different times, I'm actually going to type in 1 times 3. And, and you'll see the purpose of that here in a moment. Hit enter, and there's, there's how much money I'm going to have after one compound, okay? Uh, so do a compounding one time at the end of every year. In three years, I'm going to have $1,404.93, yeah, $1, okay? Pretty lucrative. A 12%, that's kind of ridiculous. Okay, um, a lot of stocks, you're not going to see any close to that. Um, uh, savings accounts, stuff like that, you're going to see like less than 1%. Um, there's some like money market accounts out there that you might see like 1.5% to 2.5% uh, interest rates. 12% is just kind of, it's nuts. Um, 
schools. But the next thing says, okay, what do you what happens if you do it uh, semi-annually? So I just hit second enter. And now I can edit this line. I'm gonna come in and where I saw in, I'm just gonna change it to two. And now I get four, 14, 18, right? Okay. I want to see what was it quarterly. So I'm gonna go back and I'll change in now from a two to a four. And I'd be at 14.25. I think the next one was what? Monthly? So I'm going to change that 4 to a 12. Oh. So to do that, so, so to go from like one character to two characters, you got to hit that second insert. Um, to be able to do that. And now I've got 14.30, right? Okay. If I wanted to see what this was, compounded 365 times. Something like that. What did I do? Oh, missing parenthesis. So you get 1433.24, uh, okay? So you see that when I compounded 353 more times, right? It only made three more bucks, okay? Let's, let's see what happens if I compound this thing. Instead of uh, 365, let's go 965. I don't know. You got to figure out what duration that was. It's obviously couple times a day. Um, I get 1433.29. So I, I make so I add six hundred compounds and I only make five more cents, right? Well think about why. If you were to graph this thing, if you're gonna graph it, it's exponential, right? It's growing, right? Eventually this portion of my curve is gonna be very, very steep, right? It's going to be almost straight up and down. So eventually, as X gets very, very large, my Y value is not going to change very much. Okay? Um, the idea eventually, guys, is that I don't want to compound daily or every 12 hours. Okay? So twice a day or every uh, six hours, maybe four times a day. I want to compound maybe 100 times every second. Does that make sense? Okay, or a hundred times every nanosecond. I want to compound continuously. So the instant that I earn a dividend off my principal, I want that to roll over and become my new principal. Does that make sense? So we call that continuous compound. Okay, uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. But this, for the most part, right now in section 4.1, that's going to be kind of the story problem that you see uh, in your homework. Okay. Other story problems you might see in your homework is that they're going to say, here is a situation of like bacteria spreading or a virus spreading, and they're going to give you the formula. Does that make sense? They'll give you the equation. Sorry interruption, students. Please check your email. Uh, I've sent to you a copy of the rotating Wildcat time schedule for those that may be confused. That should be in your email. So if you're wondering where you should go with it this week, Send the third through the seven. Please check your email. Thank you. All right, so that, that equation that you're always presented with in a situation is they've collected data, and they've done kind of what we did uh, with, like, the least squares process uh, with the line of best fit. They, they collect data, and they plot it, and say, oh, well, it's exponential. So then they do an exponential, exponential regression, okay? And that's how they come up with those formulas. A lot of times they're called logistics formulas or, or logistics models. Uh, when we're talking about growth, uh, same thing can happen for decay. But you might see some questions that give you weird looking uh, things like this. Okay, uh, Everything that is a growth kind of thing is going to be uh, a formula that looks kind of like that money formula. That, that compound interest guy doesn't just have to be for population of dollars, it can be population of a virus, population of. Uh, bacteria or whatever, okay, population of fish in a pool, okay, um, it is 
whatever it can be, or whatever situation you're at. All right? So 441 is open. Be due on Wednesday, I believe, is when we got cut off. Uh, tomorrow we'll start 4 2. Um, my schedule has already got something thrown into to, uh, a wrinkle thrown into it. Uh, we we're planning on the 21st to have our test, right? Well, that uh, food drive or whatever that you guys, is it student council that, that uh, last day of school, they're trying to make that like a video day or something like that? We can't have a test that day then, right? So move that day forward one day. Okay, so on the 20th then, uh, we'll be having that, that exam. Okay, be here. Don't be absent on the 20th. Okay, uh, because you do not want to have to take that test on the 7th when you get back. Yes? Uh, it will be chapter 4 and then like 4 or 5 other sections from other chapters. But they're, 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 a lot of it's review. Okay.